class. Welcome to these recordings of chapter 17. I'll divide chapter 17 into two parts and two recordings. And part A, or the whole chapter actually has to do with the heart. And part A will review a lot of the anatomy and blood flow through the heart while part B looks at some of the electrical activity. Um, so there's a lot of good information to know in parts A and B. And again, I'll try to highlight that information for you. Um, in general, you should have a very good understanding um, of kind of the basic anatomy of the heart and how blood flows through the heart. Um, so some of these slides, um, I know I always say it'll hopefully be a review from anatomy, but you should, you know, spend some time really understanding uh, how the heart works. Remember, there's four chambers to it, and it's kind of the center of our transport system in the body for our blood, and it consists of two side-by-side -side pumps that eject the same amount of blood out um, at a time. The right side of the heart receives oxygen poor blood from your tissues. So all the blood in the body drains oxygen poor blood to the tissues that this will pump blood to the lungs then to pick to get rid of the carbon dioxide, pick up oxygen via what we call the pulmonary circuit. And then the left side of the heart receives oxygenated blood that's come from the lungs and then pumps that oxygenated blood to the body tissues via the systemic circuit. These are the chambers of the heart, the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle and left ventricle. The atrium are on the top and the ventricles are on the bottom. And we always label the rights and left sides of the heart based on how it would sit in a patient or a person, not how you are looking at it, but how it would actually be in the person themselves. Um, so you should know how blood flows through these chambers, which is what we will go through. Um, this is a picture showing the systemic and pulmonary circuits. So in blue, it's showing deoxygenated blood returning to the right side of the heart, um, going into the right atrium to the right ventricle, going out the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary aortic arteries uh, to eventually pick up oxygen from your lungs. And then that oxygenated blood will return to the left side of the heart, into the left atrium, left ventricle, and the left ventricle will pump the oxygenated blood out of the aorta and two of all of your body's systems and, and tissues and cells. So the pathway to the lungs to pick up oxygen is called the pulmonary circuit, and the pathway that blood takes to all of your body's tissues and cells is called the systemic circuit. So your heart itself is about the size of your fist. It weighs less than a pound. It's in the mediastinum area, which is the area between the pleural cavity, between the lungs. Um, it lies on the superior surface of the diaphragm. It's a little bit left of your sternum and it's anterior to your vertebral column, but posterior to your sternum or your breastbone. So this is just kind of how the heart is located um, in the mediastinum. Again, it's a little bit left to the midline of your sternum. Um, so it'll kind of kind of take up some of the lung space of your left lung. Here's a cross section or a transverse view showing where the heart lies kind of between the lungs um, the, and then in front of the body of the vertebra. The base of the heart leans toward the right shoulder. So what that means is your heart is kind of tilted back on itself so that the base of your heart will lean kind of towards your right shoulder and the apex or the pointed part of the, the heart will point towards your left hip. Um, the apical impulse can be actually palpated between your fifth and sixth ribs just below your left nipple. And doctors will sometimes feel for that as well. So your heart is kind of turned on its back. The apex kind of points towards the left hip. And then the base of the heart kind of sits back towards your right shoulder. Uh, you should know the layers of the heart and the walls of the heart. The pericardium is, first of all, kind of the double walled sac that surrounds the heart. It's made up of two layers, the superficial fibrous pericardium, which just protects and anchors the heart to the surrounding tissues or structures to prevent overfilling. And then you have a two layered serous pericardium, which consists of the parietal layer, which will line the internal surface of the fibrous pericardium. And then the visceral layer, viscera always means organ. So this will be um, the layer on the external surface of the heart. It's also called the epicardium because it's the first layer of the heart wall itself. And these two layers are separated by a little tiny fluid filled pericardial cavity, which just helps to decrease friction as your heart is kind of sitting in that cavity. Um, there's a little less friction um, so that these two layers aren't kind of right on top of each other. There's a little space uh, between the two. 
So this looks, at the you can kind of see the fibrous pericardium, the parietal layer, the pericardial cavity, and then the epicardium. So this, as you can see here, is the heart wall itself, starting with the epicardium or visceral layer. The myocardium will be the thick layer of cardiac muscle cells. And then the endocardium is the inner layer that will line the chambers of the heart. Um, so again, you should know well, you know, these layers of the pericardium and the heart wall and, you know, the order that they go in. Pericarditis, we have an itis word. This means inflammation. So this will be inflammation of the pericardium. Um, it will roughen the membrane surfaces, causing a pericardial friction rub. So you can actually hear a creaking sound in a stethoscope. The cardiac tamponade will, will be when excess fluid leaks into that pericardial space. And this can compress the heart's pumping ability because there's pressure kind of forced onto the heart and treatment is to draw out the fluid, usually with a syringe. So then these are the three layers of the heart that you should know. The epicardium is that first outer layer, also known as the visceral layer. Uh, the myocardium will be the circular or bundles of contractile cardiac muscle cells. Um, these cardiac muscle cells make up what we call cardiac skeleton, where they kind of crisscross and interlace each other with connective tissue. What this kind of cardiac skeleton is, and I show you a picture of it, this is showing how the cardiac muscle bundles kind of create this skeleton with connective tissue. It helps to anchor cardiac muscle fibers and also support the great vessels and valves. It also limits the spread of action potentials to very specific paths. So again, these cardiac muscle cells are arranged kind of circularly crisscrossed um, to kind of anchor the valves and the great vessels together. So here's um, the aorta and here's the pulmonary trunk. And you can see how these cardiac muscle fibers kind of surround them to kind of keep them very still and stable um, because these great vessels are what blood is being pumped out to either the lungs to get oxygen or to the rest of the body. So very important to keep those great vessels stable as well as they kind of surround kind of within here, we have four valves, which we'll go through. Maybe you remember those four valves from anatomy and these cardiac muscle bundles also just anchor the four valves together. Again, we'll find out while it's, that it's very important for these valves to be stable, that they close all the way. Um, so this is what we call kind of the cardiac skeleton, um, the muscle fibers intertwined with connective tissue. Um, the last thing that it does, again, it, it kind of keeps the electrical activity flowing through the heart down a specific path. And that'll be really important. And we'll see that in part two, the electrical activity of the heart. The heart can maintain its own heartbeat and the cardiac muscle bundles help do that as well. The endocardium is the innermost layer. Um, and this will line the heart chambers and cover the cardiac skeleton and the valves. So again, you should know well, um, there might be one or two questions about the layers of the heart. Then we have internal chambers, the superior atria, the inferior ventricles. The interatrial septum is a wall between atria and the interventricular septum is a wall between ventricles. Within the interatrial septum, we have a fossa ovalis, which is a remnant of a foramen, a hole of the fetal heart. So in the fetal heart, the fetus inside the womb, the lungs are not developed yet. So you don't want any blood going to your lungs when you're a fetus. So what the heart has is it has a hole in between atria. So blood will go directly from the right atria to the left atria. Um, so it won't go down into the ventricles at all because from the ventricles, then it would get pumped to the lungs. So this is a remnant of a um, hole that would uh, bypass the lungs. So heart could go directly from atria to atria. So this is a gross anatomy of the heart structure. Um, I'm just gonna put that out there. There will probably be a labeling question about the, some of these structures within the heart. So spend some time um, just understanding all the structures within the heart that you most definitely learned from anatomy, you might have to review, uh, but please spend some time learning the structures, the atrium, the ventricles, uh, the chordae tendinae are the strings attached to the papillary muscles that control the opening of the valves. You have pulmonary and um, pulmonary and aortic valves, which are your semilunar valves leading up into the great vessels. So a picture like this, you most definitely will find on your exam and some sort of labeling and matching question with structures inside. Some surface features, we have the coronary sulcus, um, which lies in the atrioventricular groove between atria and ventricles. It encircles the junction of the atria and ventricles. 
we have an anterior and a posterior interventricular sulcus, which um, are landmarks that lie on the anterior and posterior surface between the ventricle wall. Here's some more gross anatomy of the heart from a surface view, and we'll go over some of these structures as well. But again, reviewing this is very important as well, and posteriorly. So the atria receive the chambers, they're small, thin-walled, they contribute little to the propulsion of blood, the oracles are little appendages of extra tissue that increase atrial volume that lie on the surface. The right atrium receives deoxygenated blood, um, the posterior part has pectinate muscles, and the posterior and anterior regions are separated by a structure called the crista terminalis, and you don't have to necessarily know those details. Um, three veins directly dump their blood into the right atrium, your superior and inferior vena cava, which returns blood from the uh, part above the diaphragm or below the diaphragm, and then the coronary sinus returns blood directly from the heart and via the coronary veins. The left atrium then will receive oxygenated blood from your lungs. It also has pectinate muscles, and you have four pulmonary veins that return blood from the lungs. More gross anatomy of the heart. Um, that I'll let you guys study on your own. The ventricles then are what we call the discharge chambers. They will make up most of the volume of the heart. So these are on the bottom. They're the ones that will pump the same amount of volume of blood out at the same time. The right ventricle takes most of the anterior surface of the heart. Because remember the heart is kind of turned on its side. So the right ventricle kind of makes up more, more of the anterior side where the left ventricle takes up more of the posterior inferior side. The trabeculae carniae are irregular ridges of muscle on ventricular walls. So those are just kind of ridges of muscle, trabeculae carniae, whereas papillary muscles actually project, they kind of look like cones into the ventricular cavity. And they're attached to chordae tendinae, which are little pieces of strings, um, heart strings that are attached to heart valves to control their opening and closing. Um, the ventricles have much thicker walls than the atria. They're the actual pumps of the heart, so their thicker walls will help to contract and push heart out. The right ventricle will pump blood into the pulmonary trunk to take ox deoxygenated blood to your lungs to get oxygen. And then your left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta, um, the largest artery in the body, as it's taking the oxygenated blood to all of your body systems that need it. This is an internal aspect of the right atrium um, shown here, and then some internal aspects of the ventricles. You can see some of the chordae tendinae attached to these cone-shaped papillary muscles and then attached to the valves. All right, so then the heart valves. We have four um, heart valves, two major types. Your heart valves are very important for ensuring unidirectional blood flow through the heart. They will open and close in response to pressure changes. You have atrial ventricular valves, which are located between atria and ventricles. So you have two of those. And then you have two semilunar valves located between ventricles and the major arteries. No valves are ever found um, between your major veins and your atria. And this isn't a problem because the inertia of incoming blood will prevent any backflow um, and heart contractions will compress venous openings. So we have a cross section of the heart looking from superiorly down we see the tricuspid valve, um, the right atrioventricular valve that has three cusps to it. And then the left atrioventricular valve is called the mitral or bicuspid valve, and it has two cusps to it. And then we have the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves, which lead to the aorta and pulmonary trunk, respectively. So your AV valves prevent backflow into the atria when the ventricles contract. This is very important. Um, because we never want blood to go back into the atria um, because any time that blood can leak through one of these valves then that will completely kind of mess up the whole idea of kind of pumping all the blood out of the heart if we have a little bit leaking back we don't have as tight of a seal within those valves it will decrease the pressure that we need to build up to force the blood out um, so we have atrioventricular valves prevent backflow into the atria when your ventricles contract and push out or eject the blood. Your tricuspid valve is on the right side. It's made of three cusps. The mitral valve is on the left side between the left atria and ventricle. And again, the chordae tendinae will anchor the cusps of your AV valves to papillary muscles that will function to hold the valves in closed position to maintain a very tight seal um, so that 
the flaps will not evert and open back into the atria. And again, that's really bad if blood flows back into the atria, because that means when your ventricles contract and eject blood out of the heart, some of the blood isn't going to where it needs to go. It might be back flowing back into the atria, uh, which will totally decrease your cardiac output values. This is a really neat kind of inter um, look at the heart and the heart valves, and then a look at a cadaver heart, looking at those heart valves as well. Here's just a look at the function of the heart valves and how they function to prevent backflow. So this shows when the valves are open, blood when blood is returning to the heart, it just passively flows through the open valves into the ventricles. Um, when the atria kind of contract a little bit, they'll force additional blood into the ventricles. And then when the ventricles contract, that forces blood against the AV valve cusps, and that will kind of slam shut the AV valves as shown here. So the cusps are completely closed and tight to prevent any backflow back into the atria. And this will occur right before ventricular ejection of blood because those valves will want to maintain close when the ventricles eject their blood into the pulmonary trunk to go to the lungs. Uh, for oxygen or into the aorta to take the oxygenated blood to the parts of the body. The semilunar valves prevent backflow from the major arteries back into the ventricles then. These are at the openings to your pulmonary trunk and aorta. They open and close in response to pressure changes and each valve consists of three cusps that look like half a moon, so that's where the semilunar name comes in. The pulmonary semilunar valve is located between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk whereas the aortic semilunar valve is located between the left ventricle and the aorta. And you can see here when the ventricles contract and interventricular pressure rises, blood is pushed against the semilunar valves and forces them open. And then as the ventricles contract, it will close again so that blood goes out of these great vesicles and not back into the ventricles. Two conditions can severely weaken the heart, and this is an incompetent valve where blood, blood will backflow. So the heart has to repump the same blood over and over again. And this can weaken your heart because your heart has to kind of work double time to get the blood out of itself because it's constantly trying to repump the same blood out. So this can weaken the heart. Valvular stenosis is when you have stiff flaps that actually constrict the opening. And again, the heart needs to work harder and exert more force to actually pump the blood. A defective valve can actually be replaced with a mechanical valve, an animal valve, or a cadaver valve. Um, and I had a student who, had, who has been through this in a different class, and it's kind of fun um, to hear his story and how um, I think his was replaced with a mechanical valve. So here's the pathway of blood through the heart. This is a great slide to study because um, you should know well how blood flows through the heart through the right side of the heart, through the left side of the heart. And again, these two slides really show well how blood flows through the heart, whether it's oxygen poor or oxygen rich. So um, kind of come back to these slides just to make sure that you understand the pathway of blood through the heart, what structures take it to the lungs, what structures bring it back. Um, and in general, you should know well this pathway. Um, not necessarily because you're gonna be tested on it a lot, but just because understanding the pathway of blood through the heart just kind of sets you up for success as we continue to work on the circulatory system. Remember too that the heart is a double-sided pump, so the ventricles are the double-sided pump. They each supply their own circuit and they each eject roughly the same amount of blood out. So equal volumes of blood are pumped to the pulmonary and systemic circuits. There's a reason why I've highlighted that. The pulmonary circuit is short, low pressure circulation because it's just going to the lungs and back whereas the systemic circuit is much longer, high friction circulation because it's going to all parts of the body. Um, the anatomy of the ventricles also reflects some differences. So your left ventricle walls are about three times um, thicker than the right. And uh, this means that your left ventricle pumps with much greater pressure. That's because your left ventricle just needs to pump blood further away. You know, your right ventricle just has to get the blood to the lungs your left ventricle has to get the blood to your fingers and your toes. So the left ventricle wall is about three times thicker than the right to pump with greater pressure. And you can see that here, how the left ventricle has a much more round shape and has a much thicker muscular wall. So coronary circulation, um, the heart muscles itself need blood and oxygen to function. 
So coronary circulation describes arteries bringing oxygenated blood to your heart muscles, and then um, veins draining the deoxygenated, deoxygenated blood back to the heart. It's the shortest circulation in the body. It's delivered when the heart is relaxed and the left ventricle receives most of your coronary blood supply because your left ventricle, again, has the thickest muscular walls. So it needs most of the blood su supply and most of that oxygen to do the contracting that it needs. The left and right coronary arteries arise directly from the base of the aorta. They kind of encircle the heart. Um, the arteries contain many junctions or anastomoses, which provide additional routes for blood delivery. They cannot compensate, though, if a coronary artery is blocked or occluded, that's called. And we'll talk a little bit about blocked coronary arteries and what problems that can lead to, such as myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. The left coronary artery supplies the interventricular septum. The right coronary artery supplies the right atrium. So we kind of have this area of coronary circulation and how these arteries supply um, different parts of the heart. This anterior interventricular artery, sometimes called the left anterior descending artery, LAD, is often a very common sign if it's ever blocked, for example, due to arthrosclerosis or a clot. Um, that blockage can be very damaging because if you don't have blood supply getting to the left ventricle, your left ventricle can stop pumping. And if the cardiac muscle cells don't get accurate, ad adequate blood supply and adequate oxygen, that part of the tissue will die off. And that's called when it scars and it destroys that cardiac tissue, that's called a myocardial infarction and that will lead to a heart attack. Um, if you do have a blockage in a coronary artery, you can have a bypass surgery, where what they will do is they will take a graft, an artery from maybe another part of the body, cadaver, animal, and do kind of a bypass. So they'll create a connection around the blockage, and that's called bypass surgery. You might have heard of someone with triple bypass surgery, which means this happens three times. They have three blocks that they need to bypass with an artificial artery graft. All the veins then collect blood from the capillary beds and return deoxygenated blood back from the heart walls, um, back to the heart itself. So here's coronary circulation um, and how the veins will drain blood back into the right atrium. Some homeostatic imbalances, angina pectoris is thoracic pain caused by fleeting deficiency in blood delivery to the myocardium. The cells can be weakened and cause kind of can cause some pain. And myocardial infarction is actually the heart attack where a coronary artery is blocked and it's blocked for a long time. So areas of the cell that are dying and they're repaired with non-contractile scar tissue. So scar tissue is left um, that is not able to contract. So it's basically tissue of the heart that is not able to function or work or contract. And if we don't have heart tissue that you can contract, we don't have a left ventricle that can pump blood out. So that's why a heart attack can be very um, scary. We'll do a couple more slides on cardiac muscle fibers. This is a little um, review from microscopic anatomy. I don't think there's too many questions about cardiac muscle cells, but you should just review what they look like. Remember, they're short, they're branched, they're fat, they're interconnected. Um, they have, uh, they're similar to the skeletal muscle cells and how they contract. They contain numerous large mitochondrial, mitochondria that afford resistance to fatigue. Um, the, base, the big thing that they're connected with are called intercalated discs. They're connecting junctions between cardiac cells that contain desmosomes and gap junctions. And what the gap junctions do is they allow kind of the cells to be electrically coupled with each other so that the heart can be what we call a functional syncytium syncytium, which means it can contract as a single coordinated unit, which is very important as our electrical activity travels through the heart. Um, there's numerous capillaries that contain connect cardiac muscle to the cardiac skeleton. So here's a look at a little bit of the microscopic, the branching cardiac muscle cells connected with the intercalated discs. And these are the gap junctions and desmosomes, which make up those intercalated discs, allowing for ions to pass through them. There's some similarities with skeletal muscle. They contract similarly with calcium binding to troponin, causing the filaments to slide past each other. Um, you can have some cardiac muscle cells are self-excitable. You can have contractile cells and pacemaker cells. 
Um, the heart will always contract as a unit, meaning the contraction of all these cardiac myocytes will ensure effective pumping action, whereas skeletal muscle cells contract independently of each other. Um, you can have tectonic contractions cannot occur in cardiac muscles, and that's because cardiac muscle fibers have a much longer absolute refractory period to allow for relaxation and filling of the heart um, chambers between contractions. Um, the heart relies almost exclusively on aerobic respiration, meaning that your cardiac muscle has more mitochondria and it depends on oxygen. So this is important. Your cardiac muscle cells cannot function without oxygen. And so that means that if there's a blockage in one of those coronary arteries bringing oxygen to that part of the heart, um, if that is blocked and the heart muscle itself cannot get oxygen, it won't be able to function, contract. When your heart doesn't contract and eject blood, you can't live very long if the rest of your body is not getting oxygen either. So here are some differences between skeletal and cardiac muscle. You might have one question about the differences, um, but not many about those. So that's part one of chapter 17, and part two will go more about on the electrical activity side of the heart. And I will post that one by tomorrow, Thursday, um, midday. So thanks for listening, guys. Enjoy your day off or kind of your week off. I gave you guys the week off of live class um, due to Veterans Day tomorrow as well. So we'll see you for the next recording, guys. Take care.